In this video lecture, we'll be looking at the eye anatomy, specifically looking at first the accessory structures associated with the eye, and then get a handle on the anatomy of the eye by looking at the layers of the eye and their composition and any specialized structures such as the fovea and optic disc. And finally, we'll close with the visual path by the eye, and that is the looking at how the neural impulses travel from the retina all the way back to the visceral um, or the visual area, excuse me, in the occipital lobe. So first looking at the accessory structures. This includes the muscles of the eye, you can see here, the lacrimal apparatus, as well as the lower eyelid and upper eyelid, although that wasn't labeled, as well as some other structures not labeled like the eyebrow and eyelashes. So let's first look at the eyebrow, eyelashes, and eyelids. First, the eyebrows. The eyebrows are designed for two reasons. One is protective in that any sweat that falls down your forehead would be blocked by those eyebrows and prevent it from entering your eye and causing irritation. The other is for light absorption and refraction. That is the dark color here will absorb some of the light so the, the light from the sun isn't as glaring. And football players or, or baseball players take advantage of that principle by putting black stripes underneath their eyes again as you can, um, to help absorb some of the light and keep it from glaring, just like De Devin Hester here from the um, Chicago Bears um, uses it so he can catch the football better. The eyelids are, of course, in protective nature to close the eye, to help also regulate the amount of light entering the eye, and some structures associated with that include the lacrimal caruncle, um, this is the area in the inside of the eye that consists of sebaceous and sweat glands. And this is the stuff that you see accumulating in your eye that we call sleep. The epicanthal fold is seen in individuals of Asian descent where other ethnic groups don't have that. Um, and then, of course, the obicularis oculi is the muscle underneath the eyelids that help control the um, opening and closing of the eyelids as a protective reflex. Then finally we have the eyelashes. The eyelashes are also very heavily um, innervated, so they're very sensitive to uh, touch, and that way anything touching the eyelids will cause an automatic reflex of, of blinking or closing your eye, again, to protect the eye from the, anything damaging it. The conjunctiva is a mucous membrane that covers the surface of the eye. It's very thin in nature and it keeps the eye from drying out. In this picture, the conjunctiva consists of this layer that's colored in various different colors. Um, the couple, and they're all named different structures. The ones I want to uh, pay attention to include the bulbar conjunctiva. That's the yellow region here that covers the white of your eye or the sclera. It has uh, blood vessels in it that are visible if you look at it. And this is the blood vessels that we constrict by putting visine in our eyes that we talked about when we did the autonomic nervous system physiology. There's also the conjunctiva sac. This is this area here where the conjunctiva folds into two layers. This is where we um, have contacts fit into this conjunctiva sac to hold it in front of our eyes. And then last, of course, is the conjunctivitis is a um, infection of the conjunctiva, more commonly known as pink eye. And if you're aware of this, you know it's very contagious and can be spread from person to person simply by if touch. So in other words, if I have conjunctiva and I touch my eye and then touch you or your eye, then you can spread it very easily. Another accessory structure of the eye is the lacrimal apparatus. This is in charge of producing tears, which are the lacrimal secretions. Tears are just a dilute saline solution that contain particular things like lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that attacks bacteria, as well as the antibodies that would attack bacteria. And then mucus to make moist, um, keep the eye moist and um, keeping fluids moving across the eye. So the idea here then is first that fluid, these uh, tears are made in the lacrimal gland. They then travel or dispensed over the eye and travel over the surface of the eye where they collect in what are called 
um, lacrimal canaliculi. If you look on the inside corner of your eye on both the upper and lower lids, you'll see a little black dot. That's the opening into the lacrimal canaliculi. From there, the fluids will then enter the lacrimal sac, and then finally, through the nasal lacrimal duct, they'll enter into the nasal cavity. So if you have an overproduction of tears, say if you're crying or your eyes are irritated, all that extra tears will accumulate in the nasal cavity and cause your nose to fill up or to run. The external eye muscles are also an accessory structure. There are six external eye muscles. Your book goes into a lot of detail about their different functioning. Don't worry about that. I do want you to know, though, which cranial nerves are involved in controlling those eye movements, and that's going to be cranial nerves number three, four, and six, if you remember what they are. Hopefully you do, but if you don't, they are the ocular motor, the uh, trochlear, and the abducens. Any problems with the external eye muscles and holding the eyes straight can lead to diplopia or double vision. Um, or a congenital weakness of the eye muscles called strabismus. And this is more commonly called lazy eye. Now, if to surgically fix this, what the eye doctor will do is come in and cut out a section of that uh, muscle and then reattach it to shorten the muscle and thereby pull it more or compensate for the weakness of that eye muscle. Now we'll turn to the layers of the eye or tunics of the eye. We have three layers of the eye, the fibrous tunic, the vascular tunic, and then the retina, or sometimes you'll hear it called the neural tunic. So we'll start with the first going out and working our way in. We start with the fibrous tunic. The fibrous tunic is this in blue, the outer layer here. It is a dense connective tissue consisting of the sclera, which is the majority of the um, fibrous tunic. This is the white of your eye, and then in front of that is the cornea, which is one of the lenses of the eye. Now the cornea is made up of um, just, again, dense connective tissue, but it's avascular and very clear transparent because, of course, we want light to be able to move through it so we can have focus on the retina. Um, since it doesn't, isn't composed of many cells, it is easily transplanted. So we don't have to worry about uh, rejecting any transplanted cornea. Simply there's no cells there for our immune system to recognize as being foreign. The vascular tunic is the next layer in. That's the pink layer here. And it consists of the a large portion of it being the choroid or choroid coat. The choroid coat has a rich um, blood vessel supply because it's going to provide nutrients for the retina and it also has um, melanocytes that produce melanin which is a, a pigment um, that helps absorb um, light and keep it from uh, bouncing around in the inside of the eye. The front portion of the um, vascular tunic is called the ciliary body the ciliary body is composed of a lot of different structures, one of which is the smooth muscles, sometimes referred to as ciliary muscles, and those ciliary muscles are attached to suspensory ligaments here, which then in turn is attached to the lens. And this, is going to, this system is going to control the diameter of the lens and then how well light focuses in on the retina. And that's going to be really the subject or the um, focus of our, when we talk about optics of the eye. So we'll talk more about that later. The ciliary body is also responsible for making the fluid that circulates in the front of the eye. We'll talk about that again in a little bit. And finally, it has also the iris. The iris has um, two sets of smooth muscle to control the diameter of the pupil. That is the opening located here that allows light to enter into the inside of the eye. So that way we control either how it caused the pupil to dilate or constrict and therefore re maybe restrict the amount of light entering. Iris has only one pigment that's brown and so even if you have blue eyes it's still a brown pigment. It's just how much of that brown pigment is present determines your color of your eye. So if very little brown pigment causes your eyes to look blue 
A lot of brown pigment means your eyes look very brown or dark brown. And then to get green, gray, or a light brown, it's just some proportion of uh, brown pigment in between those two extremes. The inside layer is called the retina, or as like I said, the neural tunic. It's composed of two layers, a pigmented layer and a neural layer, and we'll look at that in more detail in this next slide. The pigmented layer is this layer indicated here. It is exactly that pigmented dark color to help, again, absorb light rays so they don't go scattering around inside the eye. It's also in charge of removing any dead or damaged photoreceptor cells, those rods or cones, and then storing vitamin A so we can make the photopigment that's used to convert the light rays into um, action potentials or neural potentials. The neural layer consists of the, in, this innermost layer of rods and cones or photoreceptor cells, which are connected to another cell called the bipolar cell, which in turn is connected to a ganglion cell. The axon on the ganglion cell then collects and has to exit out the eyeball here. So that means when light comes in, the light rays have to actually bypass the ganglion cells and bipolar cells and then hit the rods and cones and cause them to um, have a graded potential. Um, and then that graded potential will travel to the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells, and then out the axons as an action potential. Okay, traveling here. Which means all of those ganglion cells throughout the entire retina have to, those axons have to collect up and exit out the optic nerve. That means there's no room for any rods and cones because this area here is just too crowded with axons from all the ganglion cells throughout the retina. That produces what's called a blind spot or optic disc. Literally, since there's no rods or cones there, you are blind in that spot. And we can see the optic disc or blind spot here in this slide, where the center here indicates the blind spot. And that means then you have a, a region or a circle in your field of vision that does not pick up any light rays. But of course, we don't have a little circle of floating around on our image that's just blank because our brain's pretty tricky. It can fill in um, that area based on the information around it. Now the photoreceptors are either rods or cones and they're divided into segments. The outer segment is where we are gonna find the photopigments in these discs. Um, and the shape of that outer segment is what gives the rods and cones their name. So rods have a rod shape, cones have a cone shape to that outer segment. The inner segment is the area that includes the nucleus. The nucleus is in charge of making, or the nucleus and cell body itself, is in charge of making the photopigments, and then those photopigments be transported out into the outer segment. Now the rods are very sensitive to light. It does not take very much light at all to get a rod to fire, so they're really good at dim light. So in other words, in the dark is where you're going to use a lot of your rods. Um, the rods are more concentrated in the peripheral areas of the retina, not right in the back where we focus light, but we have a lot more rods than we do have cones, so they're more numerous than the cones. The cones are used in, can only be used in bright light because they're less sensitive to light. So as you can see, they're also for color vision, so during the day when there's plenty of light or in a well-lit room you see in color turn all the lights off or go outside in the middle of the night, you're not really seeing in color because there simply is not enough light for the cones to fire. And so you don't, you see basically in black and white. The cones, however, are also used for sharp or acute images because of the way the rods, or excuse me, the cones are connected to the bipolar cells and ganglion cells. And we'll see that later when we talk about phototransduction. An area of the retina just lateral to the blind spot is called the macula lutea. And the macula lutea is this oval disc here, and the pit inside of it is called the fovea. Now the fovea contains only cones. And the reason we have this area that's only cones is because when light enters the eye, all that light ends up being focused right on the macula lutea or the fovea. And so we're gonna see the best 
with that fovea because that has only cones in it. I remember cones are for visual acuity, okay? And we can see that here. Here's the fovea here that consists only of cones. Notice there's rods, a lot more rods, out around the outside of the um, fovea. Or we can see it dry, um, in a diagram here where basically think of this x-axis as you flattened out the um, retina. So right here at zero is the fovea and then moving towards the nose, so many degrees towards the nose, and moving so many degrees towards the temporal bone. So right at the fovea, notice we have a lot of cones, and moving either direction away from that fovea, the number of cones decreases. Whereas if you look at the rods, you start out here at the fovea, there's no rods, but as you move away either direction from the fovea, the number of rods increases. And then of course you get out far enough in the periphery of the retina, the numbers start to decrease, but the total number of receptors, of photoreceptors decreases there. One of the problems we have with the um, retina is what's called a detached retina. This is when the retina or the neural layer of the retina separates from the pigmented layer you can see here. This can happen particularly if you get a, a strong blow to the side of the head or by the eye that literally shakes the eyeball and it can cause the retina to tear. The problem being here is that these rods and cones that make up the neural layer aren't attached to the pigmented layer underneath it. They just sit a little bit kind of embedded sitting in that pigmented layer. So it doesn't take much for the rod or cones to separate from the pigmented layer. Now the problem comes when all the fluid from the vitreous humor um, accumulates underneath that layer of rods and cones of the neural layer. Remember it's the vascular, or excuse me, the pigmented layer that's vascular and then provides the nutrients for the <clears throat> for the um, neural layer of the rods and cones. But now if you have fluid accumulating in here, these they're separated and so the rods and cones can't get the nutrients they need and so then they die. So you go blind in that region. Often that may be the entire retina because once it starts, it keeps accumulating, accumulating more fluid and separating the entire retina from the eye. So that's not so good. So actually this is one of the reasons why I like to point out that the octopus actually has a better design than we do in its eye. If you look over here on the left, this is a human eye. So here's the rods and cones buried a little bit into the pigmented layer and then the axons of the ganglion cells have to move in across the surface and then exit out through the optic nerve like I mentioned before. That leaves us the blind spot. Okay, and it also means those rods and cones aren't anchored to that pigmented layer, so it's easier for them to detach. If you look at an octopus eye, it's in reverse. The rods and cones are pointing out towards the middle of the eye. The bipolar cells and ganglion cells are behind it, so the axons of the ganglion cells exit out behind the rods and cones out the optic nerve. So notice I don't have to deal with the blind spot here. Okay, I've got rods and cones the whole way around. Also, those, these um, axons and the bipolar cells and ganglion cells can act almost like an anchor or a rope holding the rods and cones in place and holding them against that pigmented layer. So octopus can't have a detached retina either, a better design. Now, if you look at the chambers of the eye, they are the segments of the eye. We actually have two segments the posterior segment and the anterior segment. The posterior segment is that area behind the lens in here. It's filled with a fluid called vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is kind of jelly-like when you do a dissection of the cow eye. In lab, you'll see it's very jelly-like, kind of like gross looking. Um, it's this vitreous humor is, that you have now in your eye is the same vitreous humor you had when you were born. It never changes. So it's a static fluid. That's not what we see in the anterior segment. Now the anterior segment is divided into an anterior chamber, kind of between the cornea and lens, and a posterior segment between the, lens, 
the, um, assuming the anterior chamber is between the cornea and iris, the posterior chamber is between the iris and the lens. So you can see here, this would be the anterior chamber and between the lens and the iris is the posterior chamber here. Both anterior and posterior chamber within the anterior segment are filled with aqueous humor. Now aqueous humor is constantly circulating. It's not static. So the ciliary body is in charge of making that aqueous humor and then it circulates through the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber where it drains through some pores at the base of the um, ciliary body here. Um, if something though blocks the drainage of that aqueous humor, it can start to accumulate and build up pressure in this anterior segment and lead to what's called glaucoma. Glaucoma is simply a buildup of pressure in the eye. So if I have a buildup of aqueous humor here of this fluid because it can't drain, it's going to put, build up pressure here. It's going to push the lens back, pushing the lens against the vitreous humor behind it, building pressure there. And then that's going to push into the retina and can cause the retina um, to be damaged and you can go blind. The last thing we want to cover then on the anatomy of the eye is the visual pathway to the brain. Now, in some portions of this pathway, it's pretty simple. We've kind of gone through this already, um, but let's look at it again. So light enters the eyeball into the center of the eye. Here, it's going to travel and go by the ganglia on the bipolar cells and trigger the rods and cones to um, have an impulse, a neural impulse. From there, that neural impulse travels to the bipolar cells here, and then from there, the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells here. The ganglion cell axons then leave the inside of the eye and travel out the optic nerve. Now from there, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. Let's first get oriented on this diagram here. This is a diagram, obviously, of the brain and the eyes, along with the optic nerve, optic chiasma, and optic tracts. Now, this is a, uh, to get oriented, this picture is looking up on the underside of the brain. So imagine if you were looking up underneath somebody's chin and could see their brain, how it would look. So notice this side is the left side or the left eye. Here's the right side of the right eye. So this would be the left visual field, and this is the right visual field over here. So first, let's say light coming in from the left field, the purple. So you're seeing something off to the left, okay? Then that light would come in here for the left eye, would hit the medial aspect of the left eye. So along the nasal side or medial aspect. For the right eye, that light would come in and hit the lateral aspect of the right eye, okay? Light coming in from the right or from the green, so the right visual field, the light coming in here would hit the medial aspect of the right eye or the lateral aspect of the left eye. So that light would trigger the rods and cones to fire, depending on where the light's coming from. So the rods and cones over here is going to be triggered by light coming from the right visual field. The light over here is going to be tr the rods and cones that um, receive light over here are going to be triggered from the light coming from the um, left visual field. Okay, so if we look from there, then the light then is going to exit, or excuse me, the impulses are going to exit the eye and travel through the optic nerve here. Okay, so these, the green line represents all of the axons of the ganglion cells from that were connected to rods and cones here. The purple one represents all of the axons of the ganglion cells that were connected to the rods and cones along here. Okay. So then next, it's going to travel again out the optic nerve. And then now at the optic chiasma, it gets a little tricky. 
Here, the fibers from the medial aspect of each eye cross over. So look at this. So here, light comes in from the left visual field, hits the medial aspect of the left eye, travels through these axons. Notice it crosses over. Okay? So the medial aspect of each eye crosses over. Here, the right visual field here hits the retina here, travels through these axons, and crosses over to the other side. Fibers from the lateral aspect of the eyes do not cross over. Okay, So light from um, here, okay, from the right visual field, hits the lateral aspect of the eye travels down this green axon, but notice it doesn't cross over the optic chiasma, it stays on the left side. Light hitting here on the lateral aspect of the right eye came from the left field, hit through here, hit the lateral aspect of the right eye, travels down this purple axon, and notice it doesn't cross over either, it stays on the right side. So from there, so we've got some fibers crossing, not but not all of them. From there, the fibers then travel down the ox, ox, uh, excuse me, optic tract and eventually reach the occipital lobe or the visual cortex. So in the visual cortex, the left side of the brain sees the right fields from both eyes. So this left visual cortex sees what's from green uh, here, so the, the um, right visual field. Whereas the right visual cortex picks up the impulses from the left visual field. Okay? So, there's, so now what's tricky is to imagine what would happen is if, let's say, um, we have some damage. Let's say a doctor goes in, has brain surgery, not a very competent doctor, and he cut the optic tract here of the uh, left optic tract, okay? What's going to happen? Are you going to go blind in one eye, both eyes, or part of each eye? Well, if you said part of each eye, you'd be right, because if I cut here, that means any impulses coming from the green don't get back to the left visual cortex, and I don't see. So I don't see anything in green, anything coming from that field, but notice both eyes are affected. The lateral aspect of the left eye, the medial aspect of the right eye is going to be affected by cutting that optic tract. Okay? What if instead I have a blow to the back of my head that damages the right visual cortex? Then what happens? Does that mean I don't see with my left eye? Well, no, I don't see with part of my left eye, but I also don't see, part, see with part of my right eye. So if you go up here, Notice it's whatever I see with purple. I wouldn't see if I damaged the right visual cortex. Okay. So last thing is that the idea of depth perception is due or binocular field of view is because of the fact that our eye fields overlap. So this area where the two fields of vision overlap, you get a slightly different perspective of the item you're looking at and therefore the visual cortex can interpret those images and then gives a little depth perception or a little three-dimensional feel to whatever it is you're looking at. So with that, that concludes our uh, look at the anatomy of the um, eye. And then the next thing we'll be turning to then will be the optics of the eye and exactly how we focus light on the retina.